Bom, eu acho que a gente vai começar, né? Muito boa tarde, bem-vindos ao Instituto de Estudos Avançados aqui na USP. To this advanced course at USP, I, I, will, I will start talking in English very soon. Well, advanced Studies of the University of São Paulo. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce you this afternoon to Professor Winfried Menninghaus, who is probably um, today the main specialist worldwide on um, aesthetics, empirical aesthetics, let's say so. Um, I will take some minutes just talking about the main points of his biography. Um, Grimfried Menninghaus studied philosophy, German language and literature, and political science at the universities of Marburg and Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, 76, he made his um, Master of Arts thesis in Germany. In 79, his um, PhD on um, Benjamin and Paul Celan. Um, in 86, his um, habilitation in Portuguese, we would say, Livre de Rosencia, Tese de Rosencia, um, on the art theory of Jena Romanticism. And uh, immediately afterwards, he, um, no, um, in, the, in the time of uh, 79 until 60, uh, 86, he worked uh, part-time at, uh, not at a university, but at an institution that is um, nearly equivalent to German university, or perhaps, perhaps ma ma more important than one of the uh, many um, uh, universities we have in German. And the institution I'm referring to is the Zurkamp Verlag. Um, the funny thing, that, that was um, an, an information that spread around the um, Germanistic scene in Berlin um, at the time, that imme immediately after his, uh, uh, um, his um, doctoral thesis, he was contracted by Zurkamp Verlag to be a lecturer in the, in the Zurkamp Verlag, to be responsible for um, lines in humanities, and so he contributed a lot to um, the translation and the publication of a lot of um, important intellectual works in that um, German um, publishing house. So he worked as well in universities, um, especially he has been um, for nearly 30 years um, professor at the Peter Sondi Institute, that's um, the most important institute of comparative literature and um, literary theory in Germany. Um, he has been, a lot of that time, he has been the director of the institute. And in the last years, um, when he was working at the institute, he as well was responsible for the founding and um, afterwards for the directing of something we, uh, that has been called in Germany Cluster of Excellence. That has been a new kind of interdisciplinary uh, project structure, big um, scale um, structure, funded by the uh, German government to create uh, at some universities a uh, nuclei of um, interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary research on uh, special topics. So he introduced at uh, the Freie University in, in Berlin that cluster of languages of emotion and to a great deal designed the studies. Um, I think it involved about 40, 50 researchers at all from uh, nearly all um, disciplines you can imagine, not only literature and the other art disciplines, but as well psychologists, neuroscientists, and so on, sociologists, and so on. So that work at the cluster had um, to be finished at some time, and um, uh, Winfried Manning was, was so lucky to have the opportunity to continue his work uh, in even better um, um, conditions uh, last two years uh, that has been established that possibility is the founding director of the newly created um, Max Planck Institute, basic research um, at Frankfurt, um, Max Planck Institute for Empirical um, Aesthetics. So he is one of two actual um, founding directors. There will be m more two that will join them, but she is already studying his work. Just some more um, details on his career. He has been working at um, great institutions worldwide, Ehes Paris, 
and the Rice Humanities Centers, Houston, Texas, Princeton, Yale, Berkeley, um, Hebrew University, Jerusalem, and he has offered, uh, he has refused offers to uh, become a senior lecturer um, at Bonn, Germany, Yale, Princeton, and won a lot of prizes too. So that's perhaps some idea. We, we don't have many books of him, unfortunately, here at our library of the Fefeleshi. It's, it's, it's some kind of um, shame no, for us <laughs> that there are only a few of them, but um, there are uh, 13 monographs he has published. Uh, several of them have been translated to English, to Italian, to Japanese, and to Czech language. I don't know what more. Well, a um, lot of these publications are centered on his first research topics that have been Walter Benjamin, um, uh, Paul Celan, the early Romanticism at Jena. And in the last years, it has become more and more topics of um, the history of thought. There has been one book uh, on um, um, the topic of um, repulsion, uh, the, the, the emotion of repulsion, how it is, has been um, um, configured in artworks since uh, antiquity. And the last books are in general on evolutionary aesthetics and empirical aesthetics. So I think uh, without going in further detail, that would be enough to have uh, an idea, even for those who don't know him, uh, of what is expecting us today. And, well, I, I'm very pleased that you um, accepted our invitation, and I will give you the word now. Well, well thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation, for giving me the opportunity to present my current research here. Uh, hopefully you do understand me now with the microphone. Is that fine? Uh, well, that could, should be adjusted back there then. Well, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, once an introductory remark takes more than three minutes, uh, it, it's, it's a sense on my part that it may turn already into a funerary, you know, <laughs> retrospective speech, <laughs> which is an ironic predicament. Uh, but I'm, I'm still giving a lecture, though. So my, my lecture today will focus on a uh, preoccupation of mine. I have worked on the topic of being moved for a while, and I did so using the classical tools of a literary scholar, meaning I looked into what do Cicero, uh, uh, what does Cicero say about it, what do 18th century authors say about it. And uh, well, unfortunately, you know, it turned out that I wasn't quite uh, convinced that only kind of retracing the historical semantics leads to a substantial, sub uh, significantly uh, uh, um, attainable understanding of the terms. And so what I will present you today are a number of novel approaches to the question, what does it mean to be moved by an artwork? Uh, I start out with giving you uh, a survey of the state of the field in poetics and rhetoric uh, in aesthetics and psychology. Uh, the second uh, key portion of my talk uh, will then try to analyze the emotional state of being moved. And I do so using tools from uh, psychological research, which uh, prior to our uh, work have not been applied to that field. Uh, in the final sec section of my talk, I will present you two studies. Uh, we have performed first on sadly moving films, and second, on poems that are either sadly moving or joyfully moving. And the, the, the last part of this talk uh, has uh, implications for the age-old topic of why we enjoy negative emotions in the arts, the classical so-called paradox in, 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 uh, in Aristotle's uh, poetics, so why do people actually want to see tragedies? if they uh, are exposed to deep suffering, to feelings of sadness, and even, uh, well, utter desolation. Uh, now, let me start with the, um, oops, sorry, I, I hold it in the, the wrong way. Now, uh, the tradition. Uh, Cicero, Horace, and Quintilian converged on three major goals of a good orator or poet. Uh, he or she should please 
or delight the audience, Latin delectare, he should teach or persuade the audience, or finally, he should move the audience. So this far, it seems like almost intuitively accessible to any one of us. Unfortunately, none of the uh, uh, authors from Latin antiquity have ever defined what that means. What does it mean to be moved? They just took it for granted. So, and in fact, unfortunately, that also holds uh, for the later tradition. Uh, the topic of being moved uh, became an important concept, again, in 18th century aesthetics. And we have predecessors to that development in the 17th century. I only present you two key quotations. Descartes, 1645, in a letter, the soul takes pleasure in feeling itself moved by whatever passions, meaning positive and negative ones, provided it remains in control of them. Or Fontenelle, the heart likes naturally to be moved. Well, many of you might agree that this is true. Well, having been ex exposed to all sorts of melodrama and what, whatever artworks, but the question certainly is why is that the case and what does it actually mean? Uh, now, looking into psychological research, it turns out uh, that psychologists have not really looked into that emotional state. I mean, it's not a prototypical emotion like joy, sadness, envy, pride, hate, love, or whatever. So it's, it's never made it into, into, onto a psychological emotion list, sadly so. And it's, re, it's entering the field only recently, and now we felt that's a good opportunity for us as literary scholars to kind of set a new agenda for psychology. So which we, in this case too, we kind of, of re-channel, I mean, a topic from poetic and rhetoric into the sciences in order then to profit on our own end from what the, we can do with, you know, with the use and with the help of the sciences, including uh, uh, getting access to different types and novel types of analyzing uh, the responses to artworks. Uh, now, um, the, t the emotion term, being moved, is similar in some respect to other terms, like being touched, being shattered, in that these terms differ from more prototypical emotion terms uh, in that their semantics appears to offer little, if any, cues regarding the elicitors or the intentional objects of the designated emotion states. Just think about it. Uh, I mean, if you say uh, the word hate, you, you, you always think about an object of the hatred. Or anger, you think about an eliciting agent who kind of makes you angry. But being moved is, to some extent, self-focused. It only tells you something about your own emotional state. It's a self-focused emotion term. The same applies to being shattered, being excited, uh, uh, um, being, being stirred, being touched. So those seem to be a number of, of uh, emotion terms, terms that specialize into looking into how you feel yourself feeling something not feeling the object, but you feel primarily your own feeling. So that is, means I'm moved. And then you may shed some tears while looking at, at a beautiful, sadly, movie. Uh, now, um, so that is, these states contextualize uh, feeling states with a strong, if not exclusive, emphasis on uh, the subjective feeling component. That it means on how we feel ourselves affected you know, uh, I just briefly mentioned that the subjective feeling is considered to be one key component only of an emotion. It is, however, that component that kind of monitors uh, um, all emotion components altogether. It's kind of a proprioceptive, uh, meaning self-perceptive, a proprioceptive dimension of an emotion. So, and I bring up only f in order for you to better understand what I will present, uh, I mean, the more or less widely accepted theory that emotions at least feature five components. One component being the cognitive appraisal of a situation. For instance, uh, uh, in fear, you feel something as threatening. You diagnose a specific situation as threatening, you identify the threat, and whatever. And you, are, you kind of adapt your feelings uh, according to the cognitive analysis of the situation. That's always a part of the situation, of the emotion, the cognitive dimension. 
then there is the physiological dimension. In emotion, your heartbeat may, might, get, uh, might get faster, or the skin conductance might become different. There's a whole lot of physiological measures of an emotional arousal. Uh, there are also expressive dimensions. So just think uh, about strong fear that is mostly readable from the face, also from various bodily components. And not to forget, uh, emotions typically have action components or motivational consequences. For instance, I mean, in great fear, you, might, you may decide to flee. Or, to, or if you are angry, you may decide to attack or whatever. So that is, I mean, the, typically the, the range is from, from fight to flight, typically. And, and so we have, uh, therefore, an emotion consists of, of these five dimensions. And uh, the emotion state I'm talking about has a specific, specific focus on the subjective feeling, but it is not limited to it. And I will offer you some cues to the other dimensions of the feeling state as well. Now, key questions uh, we try to address, and I can only present you a fraction of the studies we have already performed on emotion of being moved. So which events or scenarios are eligible to be labeled as emotionally moving? So what do we call typically moving? Second. Which cognitive and affective features are shared by episodes of being moved, such that they are sufficiently similar to be called by the same name, even though, as we will see, there is a broad range of possible elicitors. Now, to tackle that uh, question, we, we performed an exploratory study using a tool that is called the Geneva Appraisal Questionnaire, uh, that's a re empirical research tool in, in uh, emotion psychology. Uh, so in that case, uh, participants of the study are asked to recall and describe an event that they experienced as deeply moving, just in five lines. And secondly, after having done that, uh, they have to rate their recalled experience uh, on a number of 35 cognitive appraisal dimensions. I will, I will try to, uh, to explain all these steps, even though most of you will not be familiar with the tools. Now, what, what's the result? First of all, I mean, looking at into the, uh, to the description of the events, we kind of uh, analyzed the, uh, the short description. And it turns out that we could kind of uh, uh, order all these events uh, under a number of I mean, fairly diverse rubrics. So very high on the agenda are critical life events, such as death and funeral, pregnancy and birth, and wedding. In fact, looking into, I mean, well-established examples for high frequency of the word moving in the past few months, the most, uh, I mean, the candidate that scores highest is Nelson Mandela's funeral. So they are the media coverage I mean, explodes with, say, that what a moving is. So we couldn't feel being deeply moved. I, I shed the tears. So everyone said that. So. Or the same applied certainly to Lady Di's funeral or to, I mean, royal, royal weddings are very high on that, uh, on that agenda. But it's also, you know, applied to parent-child interaction. Like if you see your little one go to school for the first time, that might induce feelings of being moved. So as you see, I mean, you... Most people understand that right away, but it's a broad range. So it's, it's a difficult, therefore, to see what is the unifying uh, dimension to it. Uh, it's even, even broader. I mean, confession and reconciliation is another thing. Uh, it's typically not moving if you yourself confess a sin or whatever, adultery or transgression. That's, not, that's, that's a pa fairly inconvenient thing uh, uh, to do, this confession. But if you witness a confession, uh, it's a different thing. So I simply want to say, or uh, throughout all these cases, and I will verify the point later on, uh, being moved uh, to some extent is a witness emotion. That is, uh, you do not yourself contribute to the eliciting, to, to the elicitation. While strong uh, counterexample might be, for instance, shame, where you feel you are responsible for, <laughs> for what you feel. And so you're actually the agent. The causation is on your part. In terms of being moved, the causation is barely ever on your part, uh, which is uh, uh, an important feature of it. 
that also means a, a reunion uh, of you know separated people typically is more moving when observed by a third person rather than by, the, by those persons themselves, even though there are transgressions because they might think of all the time they have been separated, so they might kind of step back a little bit and become observers of the scene themselves, and then it turns for themselves into a moving thing. Uh, many other uh, events uh, have been brought up, and, and I guess, I, well, I need to get through my 50 slides. Uh, um, I just want to say, sexual abuse is not in itself moving. So what, what the people here meant in the description, that if a victim describes his or her ordeal and is, for instance, supported by someone else to overcome the ordeal, then it can, can, can be turned into a moving narrative. But clearly, uh, uh, the same applies to Holocaust representations. It can be deeply moving, but not because the killing is moving, but, but because dealing with it, dealing with it and, and the history that ensues uh, 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 that is the one. Well, uh, I think uh, you have a sense already now that it's a very broad topic. That you, it has a broad meaning, and uh, certainly my my job is to still to make it sufficiently specific, so it's not uh, uh, simply meaning what it what could be the case that being moved simply means being affected by any emotion whatsoever. That would be the zero hypothesis, which would mean it, it is not an emotion of its own, but it's simply uh, uh, being vaguely emotionally involved. But that's not true, because you can see already here that it's very selective. It is, it's focusing on highly meaningful events. Some, there's always this very strong dimension of significance to it. And, well, I, but I now let me continue to the next step. Now, this is a little bit difficult to explain for, hopefully you can read it somehow. Okay, yeah, I tried to do that. Uh, now, those are the cognitive appraisals I already mentioned, so that this tool has been developed by a number of psychologists. Uh, it's, it's been useful in the analysis of emotional states. And I don't want to go too much into the details. And as you can see, it is, as I said, it's interesting to know whether or not an emotion is caused by yourself or caused by someone else, whether or not you are in a position to cope with the situation or whether the threat perhaps exceeds your potential to respond. Now, here in this case, uh, typically only the extreme data points are interesting for analyzing the emotional state. Those in the middle, uh, the, uh, the mean, oops, the, it doesn't work with the, well, that's amazing. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen that. <laughs> it really disappears. Oh, that's strange. Okay. <laughs> this doesn't really work on the screen at all. What a thing. Look at this. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well okay. So, so no, <laughs> no pointer available. Uh, so I, so just look then uh, at the, uh, the, s the second factor, which is intrinsic pleasantness. There you can see being moved uh, loads both on the negative and the positive end. Valence pleasant, valence unpleasant. Uh, next thing, uh, causations by others, that is uh, highly important. Intended by oneself is not important, as I already mentioned. Uh, or let's only look at the two, uh, 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 at the two factors in the bottom. Now you see the power to modify the consequences is very low in being moved. And I would say that has to do with the fact that it's a witness emotion. If you get, go to a funeral, you can't do anything about the fact that the person has died. Or if you are happy about a, a, a joyfully moving event, then you have no reason to change it. So essentially, that's, it's an important dimension of the, uh, of the motion, but the most important, most significant uh, thing is the final line. There appears to be something in b uh, moving sequences, moving experiences that conform to moral and, and ethical standards and to self-ideals. So something, and specifically to pro-social self-ideals. So that is to you join, to, so you join in empathy the predicament of someone that you witness in a, in a sad movie. But there will be far more details. This is just, I mean, one of the steps to take you to a specific understanding. Now, what, 
we, we also performed a study in which we asked the question, which more prototypical emotions do you feel, d did you feel while feeling the, no the emotion of being moved? So that is, they should kind of, uh, the implication here was that being moved is a broad term, and it comes with a, a number of, of emotional signatures. And uh, it turned out in a number of studies, we have replica replicated the findings that two major factors account for more than 50% of being moved uh, uh, events, and that is sadness and joy. Oh, okay, so that doesn't work, so the, but you see it, <laughs> sadness and joy. Uh, and if we control uh, those results for, for potentially confounding uh, dimensions, then the, the, uh, that which is the, the, the green version, then you can see the two factors, sadness and joy, are most predominant. Actually, it's also int intuitively accessible. If I say sa sadly moving or joyfully moving, you right away understand what it means. But again, I try to give you a more precise analysis of what it means. Here you can see, for instance, hatred is n virtually never moving. A crime committed out of hatred would not be moving, perhaps the predicament of the victim, but not the, the crime, hatr hatred, hatred crime itself. Um, so now, at this point, we ask the question, um, can we actually distinguish using these tools? Can we distinguish uh, the emotion state of being moved from emotion states like being aroused, being excited, being thrilled, being uh, disturbed, which all have the same focus on how you feel yourself affected. And to that end, uh, uh, we try to make sure that we are dealing with a specific emotion state and not with a vague, you know, common denominator. To that end, we performed a study in which we compared these terms. And uh, in, uh, in fact, in this case, we had a huge number of participants, 815 participants. And in this case, we did not draw on the, on the classical uh, participant, namely the student in a university, but we went to citizen centers in Berlin. So, and so that is, is a fairly broad, fairly representative sample then. So the result, and, and again, I can't go into detail, so the result is the following uh, 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 representation, it shows you that uh, we clearly have, uh, I mean, a free association task elicits clearly a different structure of these uh, age terms we have compared. Uh, it's interesting to look into details, but I only want to drive home the message. We are really talking about a specific phenomenon. Now, what we did, I could not have done it because I had never acquired these statistical tools. Now, what is possible then to do uh, is to project all these data onto a two-dimensional plane. So the idea is the e eight emotion terms are eight dimensions of the overall em emotion space. So now we have uh, uh, collected many data points that account for the differences. Now, the, the problem now is to project the differences from the eight dimensions into a two-dimensional plane and that is typically done through mul metric multidimensional scaling. Don't ask me what exactly is underlying it. The computer does it by itself. It's a very straightforward thing. You simply enter the data and ask him to do the metric that multidimensional scaling. Statistics program do that, do that automatically. You don't have to be a mathematician to do it. And so what, what, do, what does it show? It gives you a matrix of the proximity and distance of the terms on the basis of the, of the empirical data we have collected. So that's actually for a literary scholar, it's interesting because in the 18th century we had all these emotion maps, love, hatred, all these things. I mean, it's, it's been a fashion in the 18th century prior to metric multidimensional scaling, obviously. And now what, what does it tell you? It does tell you, good for us, that we have a cluster like moving, deeply moving, stirring, touching, that's fairly close to each other. But the other terms are, are significantly far away from that. And once you project uh, emotions onto a two-dimensional plane, the likelihood is great that, the two, that you will find the two dimensions that have been determined to be the key dimensions of all emotions, namely valence, positive versus negative, and arousal, I mean r low versus high. So, and so
so we interpreted the, this uh, graph according to the two key uh, uh, axes of the emotional space, and then you can see that the valence is negative at the shattering end and positive at the uplifting end, and that moving, deeply moving, is somewhere in the middle. And I will, I will get back to that later. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. Let me move on. What happened? Oh, no, no. No, I don't see here. Uh, yeah, good. Now, next step. Next step, uh, feeding qualities. Feeding qualities are so-called qualia. So f it's a philosophical debate whether or not empirical studies can actually capture the qualia. So it's, uh, and in that case, well, one of the psychologists in our group said, well, we have a tool. We have a tool that uh, enables us to empirically measure the qualia to some extent. And that is the so-called semantic differential tool. That means uh, people are simply asked to project their experiences of being moved, being touched, being shattered onto a number of 35 uh, uh, semantic differentials that are composed of two opposite adjectives. And here again, you know, here you see the profile for being moved, being touched, being stirred. You could also have a profile for, for, for hatred, for envy, for everything. And again, since I want to Primarily the work on aesthetics, uh, I, I just summarized the findings. So what we found is feelings of being moved are rated as rather wide than narrow, rather elevating than depressing, uh, rather deep than shallow, rather warm than cold, rather absorbed than detached, rather grand than small, rather fine than coarse, rather soft than hard. I, I have found very few people who, who kind of say, I don't understand that, what it means. So it's, I mean, it's simply to, 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 to project your emotional experience onto a term that represents whatever type of quality. So that is one way to describe feelings, obviously. It's, it's a solid thing. And, and as you can see, you can do it in a quantitative empirical fashion, uh, leading to results where many people converge uh, on the very same description. Now, in line with the majority of these attributions, the tradition of rhetoric, poetics, and aesthetics established a close link between feelings of being moved and feelings of grandeur and the sublime. And that's primarily 18th century authors. Among many others, Kant has much said about how uh, fe the feeling of being deeply moved correlates with the feeling of the sublime. Um, now, I should add, however, that there is, like always in emotions, great cultural and historical variability. In modernity, the sublimity of being moved is both retained. It is, it is clearly retained specifically, for instance, in war films. Hollywood war films always draw on, on, on the notion of being moved for, they imply sacrifice, they imply, you know, you, you do something for your comrades, and so the, all these things are deep, can be deeply moving. Uh, but also in modernity, this, no, this notion of this link between sublimity and being moved is weakened in favor of more sentimental dimensions. Well, think about the sentimental novel in the 18th century, but melodrama of the 19th century is another such case, and now more recently, Hollywood melodrama, Hollywood sad films are clearly... They, and, and, and actually they use it for ads. So whenever it comes out in, in the United States, a deeply moving film, a moving film. You need to go to the box office. Now, uh, so in that case, in fact, uh, um, well, many of those films, for those who don't like them, uh, 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 more or less represent emotional kitsch, including grandiose kitsch. I mean, that's a, a very... Uh, significant kind, you know, grandiose sketch. And, I, and I, here I, I use the term catch as an analytical term. Uh, uh, we are also performing research on what it actually is, the sketch. Now, but obviously, since you don't protest, you have a sense of what I'm talking about. That's because, as you see, it's very difficult. So what is, what is uh, uh, rather grand than small, rather, uh, rather soft, uh, uh, rather soft than hard, and all these things? Uh, and I try to uh, go on. Now, the affective nature of an emotion is clearly important. 
And for that, that has to do with the fact that all emotions are either, either on the positive or negative scale. And I should here at this point mention that for our purposes, uh, the idea of a single continuum between positive and negative emotions is not sufficient. Uh, you know, in 18th century already, being moved was labeled a mixed emotion. And that will become more important for my talk. And in fact, only 20 years ago, psychology has started to accept that notion um, that, that emotions can have a positive and a negative meaning that are independent from each other, that are orthogonal, so to speak. And to that end, one therefore asks ever since then, not just for one data point in the continuum from positive to negative, but for two unipolar ratings of positive and negative effect. So now that, uh, having said that, so the, the sum total of the de descriptions of moving ex events I have spoken about at the beginning of this lecture uh, represents an average uh, value here of positive and negative effect as represented here on, on the slide. So that means that's an almost ba balanced uh, 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 positive and negative uh, effect uh, 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 picture. But that is kind of misleading because behind those mean uh, ratings, we have a huge uh, uh, you know, degree of variation. Now here, the next slide shows you what happens if, you will, if we divide the factors. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, the effective nature of sadly moving events. On the right-hand side, those of joyfully moving events. In both cases, you see there is a kind of mixed effect. So in, in, the sad, uh, in the sad condition, we do still have substantial positive effect and the same holds for, for the joyfully moving events, which retain an, some negative dimension. And I put this now more in narrative words, saying sad feelings cannot be moving if they do not involve some positive emotional antidotes, such as feeling empathy with someone or high esteem for a deceased person. So this is why a funeral is not just devastating, but moving because it brings up positive notions of bonding. Uh, or anticipating what I will say later on, uh, we believe that being moved has a strong relation with attachment or bonding feelings. Those are, I mean, pro-social <laughs> feelings that are not sexual in nature, but therefore may even uh, bear on, on a broader notion, like the nation, the people, or the family. Uh, and uh, joyful feelings, on the other hand, also cannot be moving if they do not include some negative affective background, such as a long separation or some other plight finally being overcome. If you sim simply win a lottery, that's, I mean, hilariously wonderful, but not moving. I mean, it can clearly be it's clearly joyful, but it's not joyfully moving. Because, I mean, no, you, no one would say so. And now episodes, therefore, we hold of being moved, routinely blend positive and negative effect in different, including inverse proportions. In this regard, they are, in fact, mixed emotions, as has already been claimed by the philosophical tradition of the 18th century. And it's always reassuring for, I mean, a literary scholar to see that those old guys also have, have really made many points. And to some extent, that's even uh, worth uh, uh, getting back to those uh, authors uh, even today. Now the final slide of the uh, general intro shows you, uh, I mean, what we, what we either have already done or are about to do in order to establish being moved as a psychological construct. So starting out with on the left end. So I have sent, presented you something about the situations or elicitors. Uh, I represented some of our findings on the cognitive appraisals. Uh, I have not presented anything on the physiology, physiology and expression of being moved. For instance, right now we are performing a study on tears in response to movies, but also on chills in response to poems. That's a very cool study. So that is where, where, where actually people experience chills reading poetry while lying in the scanner. It is really doable. I, could, it's, it's, I mean, if you want to learn more about that, Unfortunately, it's not yet finished, but I'd, I'd be very happy to, to show you what, what you can really do experimentally 
uh, when people really have a, have a feeling for poetry. So that can be so strong that even under adverse conditions, they give you the, one, the most wonderful data <laughs> for an experimentalist. Uh, okay, so uh, well, I, I, I might also mention that there is an experimental study that inducing the feeling of being moved makes people more willing to give higher charitable donations <laughs> than lower. <laughs> Urge is a very practical uh, uh, dimension, obviously. And we have an action tendency that, uh, uh, that we believe that, that something like approaching and attending, bonding and helping is of importance for all these uh, uh, things. Now we move on into aesthetic terrain. So, well, I apologize for this lengthy, uh, you know, detour, but we simply needed to develop our own tools in this regard because we wanted to understand uh, the phenomenon of being moved through artworks. That's primarily, in order to do so, you need to have a concept. In order to do so, you also need to have a demarcation line. Are there any differences between being moved in explorer to artworks or being moved by, say, real events or media represented events? And, and I start with a slide representing our findings on to that end. Now, this is now here uh, differences and responses to three ontological, ontologically different types of scenarios. On the left-hand side, you see your, the own life scenarios. In the middle, you see media represented, specifically news. Uh, and, the, and then the, uh, unfortunately, the pointer doesn't work. Uh, well, let me, let me show to you. So that sadness always means sadly moving event, joyfully moving event, own life condition, media represented uh, sadly and joyfully moving events and, and in this case it's real events meaning like news channels or something of that type or media represented sadly moving joyfully moving <laughs> events <laughs> that's actually uh, uh, fictional media so I, I hope you, you do understand somehow these slides you, you are not obviously used to to, to to reading those uh, uh, things. What you can see here, first of all, on the, on the own life side, there is a slight predominance of reporting joyfully moving events over the sadly moving events. If the thing reverses drastically, uh, if you look into media representation, so the media primarily covers sadly moving events, catastrophes and the resulting plights, and very little joyfully moving events perhaps except again for royal weddings. Let's also make it into the news channels. <laughs> and, and finally, in, 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 the, in the art or the fictional sphere, we have an even higher number of uh, uh, sadly moving uh, uh, events, but also higher, a higher percentage of joyfully moving events. Now, in the next slide, what we do is we look into the effective signature of these three ontologically different conditions and uh, uh, that shows you, I mean, I could also already show you what, what I primarily want to show you is something in the art condition that is different from the others. Namely, while here, with regard to sadness, a sadly moving events, here you clearly have a huge difference between positive and negative effect in sadly moving events, a blend. The same applies here, but all of a sudden when it comes to the arts, the level of positive and negative effect is almost equal in sadly moving events. So that is something that uh, makes, you f makes you feel even stronger about the notion of a, a mixed feeling. Now obviously there's a number of factors to it, one factor is simply what psychologists call uh, called the top-down processing. So once you are aware, this is an artwork, you know, uh, you, you're listening uh, to, to uh, uh, a song or you, you look to a movie, it's not going to threaten you. So everything, to some extent, it, there, is, there is a distancing element implied as opposed to real things. That is one factor. We have already performed experiments that show that this top-down factor the simply categorization of something as an artwork versus a non-artwork leads to, to strong differences. So we have, for instance, presented the very same story as a news report and as a story, and you get a very different results, including different brain processing. It's really, so it's a powerful thing. 
my, my presentation today, however, will not focus on that. But here you can see already uh, that uh, it's very important to look at the effective signature. So if something is said, it doesn't necessarily mean it is only a negative effect. So in, in case of being moved, we have a strong contribution of positive effect even to the feeling of sadness. Uh, and now uh, our first study. The first study uh, used 36 clips, all representing uh, the same deeply saddening moment where a protagonist learns about the death of a beloved person. And in fact, uh, well, the, our participants had to go through 36 such you know, clips in a row. Uh, and we tried it in our own group, and, and, and it turned out that they, they, they could take it, and, and the results are quite, uh, quite good, in fact. Uh, now what we did also, we presented that, uh, those clips in the, in the cinema, well, in order to have some more ecological valid validity to the experimental study, rather than being in the I mean, austere environment of, an, of a lab. And now, uh, the questions. So which were the questions underlying the study? First of all, we wanted to understand, looking back at Cicero, Horace, and Gutilian, to what extent the notion, the feeling of being moved, is not just a reflection of specific eliciting scenarios, but in fact also uh, uh, um, reflect the aesthetic appreciation itself. So to what extent does feeling oneself moved in fact translate into a positive aesthetic judgment of the artwork rather than simply you know, being derivable from a specific content? That was one qu the first question. And we had a second question. And the second question, uh, well, draws on the uh, theoretical debate regarding the enjoyment of uh, a sadly involving artworks. And one of, the, uh, one of the explanations that have been around for a while and that have found renewed support in recent media psychological research is more or less the moral sent sentiment implication, namely that in sadly moving events we feel ourselves as feeling empathy and now the, the, the interesting argument is, get, getting back to Scottish and British you know, uh, moral philosophy in the 18th century, once we feel ourselves feeling empathy, we feel very good about ourselves. So it's a kind of the na narcissistic loop. So, so be because we are so empathic, we feel like we are good people, we are good persons, and that makes us perhaps feel good about the whole exposure. Because essentially, uh, so the explanation is, uh, in, in responding to a sad film, uh, we have an opportunity to feel ourselves as good humans. That respond to, according to social norms of empathy and pity and whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing. That means, uh, uh, that would imply, first of all, that the, the notion of sadness or the feeling of sadness predicts the aesthetic enjoyment directly through a psychological mechanism. Uh, our explanation uh, takes a different view, so we believe uh, that it's not about that people don't go to the cinema in order to really feel sad, but in order to, f to feel being moved. And that's a different uh, concept, and to some extent, uh, sadness is only a contributor to the notion, to the feeling of being moved, that then influences aesthetic appreciation. To some extent, we wanted to, to use our data to at least give, arrive at some conclusions at, uh, g with regard to those very difficult questions. Now I show you the data, and that is uh, unfortunately uh, something that won't tell you too much. However, these are all correlations, statistical correlations between ratings. I mean, this is only a fraction of the data we collected, and I give you a verbal explanation. Now, what we found is, um, very high correlations be between virtually everything, which is what psychologists don't quite like because it's not really distinctive. Uh, so that is here in that case, oh, again, I can sh show you. Uh, the ratings for sadness predict the ratings for moving for overall impact well, to a significant degree. 
looking to the second line, you can see that ratings for being moved predict the overall impact, the aesthetic achievement, the motivation to see the whole movie to an even higher degree. Now, a number of you, let me just uh, try to explain what we conclude from it. Uh, first of all, I'd like to em emphasize why, why did we uh, uh, ask for the motivation to see the whole movie or, and for worth seeing. I think it's, it's a major misunderstanding of the aesthetic attitude that many psychologists say uh, in response to artworks, uh, uh, we are completely detached and there is no direct consequence. So that is a, a classical you know, understanding of the aesthetic attitude. However, there is a direct consequence in that we, in fact, you either keep going rather than you know, ch ch switch to a different channel. So staying tuned is in many cases the first action motivation that derives from a positive aesthetic judgment so going on for a longer period of time. Or duration of exposure with regard to, to images is another such you know, measure. Or in other words, or with regard to music, you can easily say if you like a, a song, you return to it. Often more than once a day. Or how, may, how often per week do you return to your favorite song? So, and this is an action tendency. So to some extent, it's, it's false to say that aesthetic feelings do not have action, direct action tendencies. So if you like a TV show, you stay tuned, otherwise you skip it. That's an action tendency, that's a vote. That's a vote. And here, so therefore we simply ask these people, having seen the clip, how big is your motivation to see the whole movie? That's, an, that's a very, you know, that's a very good measure because if you ask, how pleasant did you find the film? What most psycho psychologists did, they feel like they shouldn't say it's pleasant because someone died, they saw all this in the misery, and there they wouldn't say it. So it turned out, therefore, that this is a far better measure for, for the aesthetic motivational tendency than simply asking how much did you like the film. Then people might feel how much did you like the content of the film, and you get bad results. Uh, now, the next step is, is uh, that I mean, so what we, what we did see here is that the notions of the emotional uh, scales of sadness and moving do predict aesthetic liking to a significant degree. Now, the next question is, can we make a decision as to which is the, more, the stronger predictor of our aesthetic appreciation? And that was done by a so-called mediation analysis which is now a fairly sophisticated statistical thing. I couldn't explain you the detail. It's not something you can easily do on a computer. Uh, and there's something I learned through my work with the psychologist. There's something truly, uh, um, we are, well, impressive to statistics. So you can, do, you can do things you would not have expected that could be possible. Now, this is a mediation analysis now looking into uh, um, what, what mediates worth seeing, the attribution of the, of, the, of the word worth seeing stronger, sadness or being moved. Now, if you look simply at the correlation between sadness and worth seeing, we have a positive correlation. Now, an ideal correlation would be the diagonal. If, if all single dots would lie directly on the diagonal, that would be the ideal positive correlation. I mean, that's not too bad here. Uh, and now, the, now we, we made the test and we took the detour through being moved. Now, first of all, we, we computed uh, the correlation between sadness and being moved. That is even stronger than the one below, as you can see, a fair, very good correlation between uh, sadness and being moved for the, uh, the case of our uh, films. Then we calculated the correlation between mo being moved and worth seeing, which approaches the, an ideal correlation already. And now the thing is, once we, once we calculate the values for being moved into the sadness worth seeing correlation, this actually turns into a negative one. Um, so what I want to say you now, let me say this more in words because uh, it's perhaps more uh, you know, intuitive. Our recipients, we believe, experience sadness as pleasurable not because they like feeling sad, pitiful, pitiful and empathic as was stipulated or is stipulated by, well, the 
a, so, the Scottish philosophers and the meta response hypothesis, but we believe uh, the sadness involved in seeing a film is one of the several factors that together support the emergent feeling of being moved. That is more important. Um, I always like to, to recall a beautiful sentence of David Hume's in this regard. He said, if it were true that we uh, enjoy uh, uh, a sad novel because we feel good about our own sadness, then, he said, a visit to a hospital should be more entertaining than a ball because you have more reasons even to be pitiful and to feel empathy, but you don't really enjoy it, obviously not. I, I find this actually very, very, it's not just a witticism, it's very much to the point. And we strongly, you know, endorse David Hume's point in this regard. Uh, and so we, what we see in the data is what I call the positivity effect of being moved. So these data were taken in conjunction with a study on sad film clips. That is, at the very, very end, the participants were asked, I mean, after going through 36 deeply sad films and deeply moving films, they were asked, if you find a film moving, does that imply rather a positive or a negative appreciation of that film? And you see, the answers are all on the positive end. There's no one say, saying minus three, minus two, minus one. We have one only with a zero. So it's a clearly asymmetrical pattern. And this even in response to to a film that clearly involves your sad feelings, and in many events, in fact, people shed tears. Um, now, therefore, I think that feeling the power of an artwork to move us implies a positive judgment on its aesthetic achievement. That is the conclusion we draw. It's not just a classification according to an emotion label, but it's at the very same time. And a genuine aesthetic appreciation. And a happy end is not necessarily required for this effect. I mentioned that only in passing. The psychologist Zillman has stipulated that uh, uh, we, we only like negative or sad stories if they come with a happy end. And once the happy end is there, the preceding, uh, the preceding sadness serves as an energizing element to that happy end. In our uh, cases, there was not the slightest sign of, of uh, a happy end involved. So that was really, people were torn apart, I mean, and the clips stopped and prior to any expectation of a, of a positive turnaround. And uh, uh, now I go on to language and literature. It's a shorter thing. I go on to a set of poems we, st we studied. Uh, and I should say what I presented you in, in, in with regard to the films is confined to correlational evidence. Correlational evidence meaning you can't really say you have causal evidence. Why not? Uh, because in order to have causal evidence, you need to experimentally modify the, the experimental input. That is, uh, the, you would, for instance, have to, to present the very same uh, uh, script of a film in a deeply moving and a less moving variant. And you could then compare the, the, the ratings for all the other scales and you would arrive at a, at a causal correlation. Now, I, as a literary scholar, don't feel competent, you know, to modify the films on whatever aesthetic scale. What can you do? You can change the color to some extent through color filters. You can change the soundtrack. But you can, it's very difficult to do that in, a, in the very same fashion throughout 40 films. But now, uh, but that is exactly what we did using poetry. Uh, and in order to do, do that, you need to have a theoretical, you know, uh, uh, basis. And you know, so I, I refer therefore to a well long-standing uh, preoccupation of mine, which is uh, Jacobson's famous piece on linguistics and poetics, in, re in which he suggests it's already there. Uh, on the quotation runs, the structure of poetic language consists of patterns of ongoing parallelism. What does that mean? Well, you best understand it by thinking of a poem. There it's easiest. A, a poem has, well, 
the more traditional poems have an ongoing pattern of meter, and they have ongoing patterns of rhyme, they have other ongoing patterns on the prosodic and phonological level. And Jakobson said those uh, types of, la of language use are also to be found uh, uh, throughout other layers of language, not just in poetry. And I'm, I mean, we, I could show you that this is very much true. Now, I translate his, his theory into the following hypothesis. The key distinctive features of the poetic dimension of language is linguistic self-similarity. So I, I don't give you, I mean, uh, parallelism is a historical term get, getting back to, going back to the 18th century. Uh, barely anyone knows uh, the meaning of the term anymore. Self-similarity is a more modern term capturing the same, more or less the same uh, uh, meaning that is, multiple interactive patterns of recurrence or repetition in all dimensions, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics of sentences, speeches, and texts. What does it mean? An example, Caesar's famous saying, vini, vidi, viki. The, the sentence features seven parallelistic features. First, all words have two syllables. Second, they conform to a trochaic meter, vini, vidi, viki. They start with the same consonant, they end with the same vowel, they are verbs, they have the same grammatical form, and they are asyndetically juxtaposed. This is just, I mean, uh, an analysis of three words along, along fairly, you know, common features. So I can tell you that we have now uh, uh, very meticulously analyzed a number of poems, and basically what we found is that each syllable of a poem has three or even more than four self-similarity dimensions. So that's a dramatic finding. Uh, uh, using, using and refining Jacobson's tools uh, is re really something else. So, so we try to, to push this agenda to some extent, and I will show you the results for the issue of being moved. That is what, what I'm going to present you here. Now, I do see unacknowledged strength of Jakobson's hypothesis. It identifies a common currency shared by numerous features of poetic and rhetorical language use. Second, patterns of self-similarity converge in bestowing dimensions of perceptual rhythmicity, symmetry, proportion, self-reference, and self-containment on lingu linguistic utterances. Patterns of this type can be found ac across many, if not all, languages. It's, I mean, I, I, I really would say it's all languages. First of all, I know of no language that doesn't know meter. Obviously, I mean, many languages don't know rhyme, or even Latin Greek poetry barely uses rhyme. But if you look into the hundred or so features of recurrence uh, that are described through po rhetoric and poetics, you will find a selective number of them throughout all languages. Third, the hypothesis makes the aesthetic appeal of language comparable to patterns of spatial and temporal self-similarity that are known to support uh, aesthetic appeal in both music and the visual domain. I mean, most markedly, it's been shown time and again that, say, more symmetrical features of the human face or the human body are preferred over less symmetrical features, and the same are, uh, holds for many other things. So that is a well-established thing, and I think it's a very good thing about Jacobson's hypothesis that it relates the aesthetics of language uh, in this powerful fashion to the aesthetics of the visual and the musical uh, domain. Now, making things short, we hypothesized three things. First, the sum total of the poetic self-similarities of a given text is a composite feature that has a strong share in defining the poetic gestalt of a text. All those things alliterations, repetitions, anaphora, um, all things. Second, that this composite feature is a predictor of aesthetic evaluation. Jacobson has nothing to say about it. He simply made a linguistic analysis. He didn't connect his own hypothesis to any issue of aesthetics or emotional uh, uh, effects. So we certainly also hypothesized that presence versus absence of poetic self-similarities would influence emotional responses. And now here's the advantage of our stimuli. In that case, we had 20 
self, uh, 20 joyfully moving and 20 sadly moving events. So we could find out to what extent, in fact, the presence versus absence of these poetical features of language predict emotional impact. Okay. Now, uh, so to that end, we, we, we kind of rewrote, I'm, I'm approaching more or less the end. <laughs> we rewrote a number of poems, in this case, Rilke's Vorbei. I can't go into the details. Again, we took out rhyme, we took out meter, we took out anaphora, repetition, all these things, while, while keeping the content stable. And in most cases, also, uh, we retain the very same words, except there where we, where we took out a repetition. Uh, and now, using those two versions, Using those two versions uh, leads to a surprisingly stable effect, both for the joyfully and the, and the uh, sadly moving events. And yet, that you see here, uh, a very strong effect, a very strong effect, uh, both for liking, for beauty ratings, for what we'll you use, a melodiousness scale. Like very, very interesting that, that that worked out so nicely, but also for, for being moved. Uh, that means we had a causal predictor. We, had, we have identified a causal predictor for, for feelings of beauty and feelings of being moved through our, through our selective modification of the stimuli. We can now say, yes, in fact, feelings of being moved are not just elicited by a specific scenario, but the very making of the artwork makes a strong contribution. So that is what we wanted to show. To all, I mean, that was a, it's, it's, it's an enormous effort, not just to rewrite those poems. They need to be recorded. And it's, it's a, but, but we have now that is the reward then for us. We really found something very interesting. And, and there is another thing I want, would like to look you at. And I go already to the next slide. So we, what we have here, the encircled data points. So we have felt sadness and positive feelings. As you can see, uh, uh, positive feelings go up from the de-retoricized version to the original one, but so does felt sadness. Now that's a very intriguing feature because uh, both sadness goes up and, and positive feelings. You might feel that's a contradiction. Uh, now uh, we believe that this has a strong bearing on the Aristotelian question. Aristotle recommended that verses in tragedy often feature, he literally said so, sweet harmony, sweet melody, and sweet meter. So now, many people have misinterpreted, we believe, Aristotle as meaning that the sweetness of meter should either compensate or convert the hardness of the suffering. Um, I had never believed that, actually, and he's, he's not really saying that anywhere. Now, our data show that we, we have nothing amounting to a conversion or to a compensation, but the sadness gets even stronger, more intense, in the uh, more artful version. And that leads me to the final point. Um, and now, we believe, therefore, that what is moving about these poems is that they involve us in intensely felt emotions and that, in fact, uh, this involvement is, is inherently rewarding, needs, does not need a compensation, it does not need a conversion into another feeling, but it's more or less driven through felt intensity. And intensity is something in, uh, important in aesthetics uh, uh, because it's already, already an, an, an achievement for an, uh, for an artist to really intensely involve us in, into his uh, artwork. Uh, so, summing up, we, we feel that um, we have shown here in, in this study that being moved is directly tied to aesthetic appreciation and can by no means explain by merely referring to the scenarios that are likely to elicit feelings of being moved. And, um, and I want to give you finally, the final two slides are about the bigger theoretical framework in, in which we interpret these findings. Um, that is uh, the framework we have 
kind of adopted from recent emotion research? Well, premise one is our own. Uh, we, we believe that artworks compete for attention, for intense and emotional involvement, and access to memory. That is more or less what you see in Horace and whatever they say it expressively. So, so they want to have a hold on the uh, readers, on the listeners. Uh, and that means they need to compete for attention, uh, they need to compete for emotional involvement, and they want to be memorized, memorable. Now, emotion research has so shown that negative emotions are more powerful than positive emotions in prioritizing intention, in urgency of involvement and access to memory. While well, one classical study simply has the title, bad is stronger than good, which is what I mean most news channels also intuitively uh, uh, know and apply. Uh, I mean, there's, there's something sad about it in that it's really literally sad that joyful experiences um, more or less uh, are, are being forgotten easier than very deeply negative experiences. Now, there is an evolutionary explanation to it, mostly given in that, for instance, not responding uh, to an enemy approaching you would more or less mean you are killed, while, while missing a positive opportunity, a positive signal from someone else, may also be, be not so good, but you survive it. You have a second chance. In the other cases, you don't have a second, second chance, so not prioritizing on, on negative elicitators might be dangerous. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not a good picture of the human you know, uh, emotional system, but uh, there is very good psychological evidence in favor of that understanding. Now, having said that, the conclusion is, Hence, negative emotions are a predestined resource for the arts efforts. In fact, we believe that the, the, the so-called exception, the exceptional case of taking pleasure in negative emotions in tragedy is not the exception, but the rule. Um, and why do we feel that? Uh, it's that unadulterated beauty and the roly positive effect lacks the power to support sustained attention and deeper trajectories of effective involvement. They can easily turn out to be uninteresting, shallow, boring, devoid of a lasting impact, and Kant has it already all. He calls that the, oh, the, the, the merely beautiful. The merely beautiful doesn't really capture you. You know, and my favorite empirical evidence in favor of that is a hilarious study performed using uh, uh, cos models, female models uh, represented for cosmetic purposes, so ha hair washing models and whatever. They typically are fairly good looking uh, women, but so what they did is they, uh, th well, they hired some of these models and placed them at a bus stop in somewhere in the US. And it turns out uh, that if they, if they are placed there for a number of days in a row and the same passersby come there that the level of, of recognizing them as individuals is fairly low. It is a surprising fact, so, that, so the result is that, 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 that the pure beauty of appearance correlates negatively with distinctiveness, which is why at some point, you know, advertisements have started to, to apply some asymmetries or some, some wrinkles or whatever, so, so, you, so you get a, a recognized face. And so that, sh that shows you that there's something, if, you, if the arts would only go for beauty, they would not really uh, 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 leave behind a lasting impact. And that they have always felt so, which is why, I mean, the very first key treatise on poetics is precisely about tragedy, which is why Kant has all these nice reflections on the insufficiency of the merely beautiful to attract our uh, attention. Now, this is more or less the, the, the overall background, and, and we believe that feelings of being moved of a one version of the arts to adopt negative feelings in favor of the inherently pleasurable exposure to artworks. And uh, we believe actually also that there is a second major variant to do something similar, but a very different one, uh, and that is, uh, uh, what is what is labeled under sensation-seeking, that is the type of horror movie. Uh, the, the difference is 
effective experiences of the being moved type are mostly limited to mid-levels of arousal and always involve an oblique reference to pro-social norms and self-ideals. That does, is not true for, for sensation seekers who want to get a kick of you know, horror movies, like when people are terribly treated, and they don't feel empathy. If, you, if they were to feel empathy, they would not have necessarily the, the pleasure. Uh, so, but what we do find, what the next step of our research would be to, to kind of picture the distribution of the various types of the arts to accommodate negative emotions in favor of the, of the pleasure, of the aesthetic pleasure. And again, what I've presented you today is uh, where we have got this far regarding the being moved type. Again, that's not the only one, but that's a very important one. And thank you for your attention. Oh, this is now obviously the question and answer period. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so somebody wants to make first. Good afternoon, and thanks for the talk, the speech. I have a question about uh, Concept, a concept on cognitive psychology that you used in the beginning of your speech. I would like to know what's your point of view about uh, scenario, context, and episode, and what do you think about it? Uh, well, uh, first of all, episode. Oh, I'm sorry. As an episode, uh, I understand the extension of, of an emotional experience. So typically, I mean, uh, uh, the, the paradigm of psychological emotional research is an, an emotion is an episode. As a result, in fact, many psychologists say that love is not an emotion because it's not episodic enough. It's <laughs> it's, but that I find ridiculous. So, so I, I don't we, we do not adopt that notion. It, it is, it's more due to the to the experimental constraint. Because if you measure something, it's, it's more precise if you measure it over a short distance rather than over a long, which is why the focus all often is only on, on a very limited episode. So, but still, episode is, is the key term used in psychology to say an emotion brings about a change in your feelings, and we measure the, 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 the change between the two states, before the emotion, onset of emotion, and full-blown emotion. Now, that is, uh, therefore, that bears on the, your response. The scenario, on the other hand, is obviously the eliciting thing. And in fact, there is very little difference uh, to, from the broader notion of context. But, uh, but because context in, uh, is, is wider in meaning, it's perhaps more precise here to, to use the term either an eliciting event or an eliciting scenario, because often there might not be mu too much of an event that elicits your emotion, but you may also only sense an atmosphere somewhere. But what is then the event? So therefore, if you sense the atmosphere in a room or whatever, uh, then it's be better to speak of, well, an emotional scenario, or even people, some people speak of an emotional atmosphere. So that might that perhaps clarify a little of the way I use it. It's a very complex uh, concept, I know. Thanks for your answer. Bye. Thank you, Manninghouse, for your very interesting speech. I'm amazed to, to see how you came to this point. Well, I studied with Manninghouse about 20 years ago in, in Berlin, <laughs> and we were reading Aristotle's and Burke, Moses Mendelssohn, Lessing, it can't, and it's amazing to see all those theoreticians here again transformed into empirical aesthetics. It's amazing, really, for me to see this move for, of your research. But thinking about em empiricity, uh, I would ask, um, and remembering Aristotle, and the two possibilities of, of seeing the effects of those um, tragedies or artworks uh, at all, well, although this concept is more modern, 
but the, the idea of um, catharsis that we had at Aristotle, or the idea of contamination that we had at, at Plato. So how nowadays we are thinking this new, this new field of aesthetics? Who, who had more reason, Aristotle or Plato? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, um, this part, there is, a num there is in fact a number of studies that have tested the notion of catharsis, and they virtually unanimously agree on finding no cathartic effect. And we are not, you know, you can always say, I mean, that they did something wrong about it. Uh, but the thing is, now, uh, they had to operationalize catharsis. And there is a certainly a crucial thing, because the debate about what Aristotle might have meant by it, as you know, you know is, 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 is unended. So if it simply means uh, to purify in a very simple fashion, like uh, to, to get rid of, an, of, of the negative emotion, which is mostly what the empirical studies, you know, measured, then it doesn't work. Uh, but uh, the Aristotelian understanding of it, to my extent, is not limited to it. So to that extent, I could say, okay, I, I could perhaps envisage a different way to, t to, to test it through understanding the notion in a different fashion. And I, and I would like to emphasize that is always of great importance. You know, I have learned that reading statistics is no less, you know, flexible than reading a poem. It's so interpretation is in the beginning of designing an empirical study and in the, in the end. So in this case, for instance, interpreting the notion of catharsis leads to, to, to very grave differences in terms of empirical results. Now, therefore, I'm a little cautious in my response. To, I would say the way psychologists have understood, perhaps mis misunderstood, Aristotle's notion has led them to devise studies that they, in the end, interpreted as not proving Aristotle. So that would be the most precise way, you know, to, to and um, I also, uh, well, in, in this more or less uh, uh, um, very vague fashion, I also personally dislike the notion of catharsis. I don't believe in it either. Uh, the other one, the other question, I mean, the contamination, I'm not aware of any empirical studies in, th in this regard. And, and again, the question would be, how would we measure it? So what exactly does it mean? I mean, that's a, the bad thing about empirical study is you always have to be very precise. You need to pin down things where you perhaps feel it's impossible, but you still have to do it. Because if you don't have something you measure, there's no way to perform empirical uh, research. And, you know, notions, say, of undecidability are difficult to accommodate for <laughs> in an empirical uh, design, even though you can test it. You can clearly you can clearly measure undecidability, but then the measurement itself would not be undecidable. But again, you could measure undecidability, that's no question. Uh, now, uh, uh, yeah, this far regarding your question. Um, I have a question. The examples of uh, use uh, with their uh, films and poems where you have um, a narrative and, and the person m uh, can cl pretty much understand um, what is uh, the situation. How is it more difficult to touch or to move by static images like paintings and photography? Is there any studies on that? Yeah. No. I mean, first of all, there's very little studies on being moved at all. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of empirical studies, but uh, I think I think your anticipation uh, is basically correct. It is in general being moved is is tied to some temporal transition. But a uh, you know as has already been shown by Lessing, I mean a a picture can be composed in such a fashion that you kind of infer an underlying narrative. And for instance, I mean, some photographs have been, have been time again labeled, not with empirical research, but spontaneously as being deeply moving. For instance, a, 
uh, well, some of the pictures taken from the Vietnam War were like, like uh, a girl standing amidst the ruins of her uh, destroyed home. Uh, because once you know the underlying narrative, then you kind of it's, not, it's no longer a picture only, and actually you, have, you find a narrative moving. So, uh, but it's what is even more difficult to account for is the striking fact that we can be deeply moved without any reference to a narrative or to any content by music. So music can be moving uh, without any direct reference to the eliciting scenarios and to many of the things I've mentioned. And uh, it's, it's a very intriguing question of uh, how we can understand that. How can, uh, uh, by which means, and I would say by which psychological as well as musical means, can we experience a pure sequence of tones as moving? Um, something we also would like to, to look into. I have some anticipations, but they are not really well <laughs> developed, but I, I agree I fully agree that uh, that there are major differences between the various art forms and the visual domain and the, and the other domains regarding the potential for moving an audience. And the same holds actually for all other aesthetic appreciation terms. They are never equally applicable to all the various, uh, you know, for instance, the term beautiful, um, well, ever since the 18th century, well, let, letting others say literature altogether, well, it cannot be labeled as being just beautiful. You know, now, today, you, we, have, we have already uh, dis studied that empirically. I mean, beauty is of, of major importance in response to poetry, far less so in novels and drama. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I would like to retake the, the catharsis uh, topic, um, catharsis and empathy. Um, my question is, how do you consider in your research uh, Brecht, Bertolt Brecht's uh, experiences with catharsis and empathy? Let me explain a little bit. Uh, theater is uh, perhaps the most moving art because the actor is moving in space. So what did uh, Brecht particularly? He was preoccupied by a situation where the uh, politi political state in Germany uh, tried to move his citizens every time by very strong emotions and using them. Now what, what did Brecht? He proposed particularly in his uh, learning plays uh, in entering and uh, in, and uh, getting off emotions, uh, uh, the pleasure, the particular pleasure uh, of uh, Brecht's learning plays is to play with emotions. I may uh, hate, I may love, I may have another feeling uh, about another person, but I'm just playing with it. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm uh, playing with my scale, my possibilities uh, of uh, emotions. S uh, and I'm not just a person to be measured or to be used by a uh, uh, political system, but I am an active spectator. How do you consider this in your, uh, uh, in your research? I mean, there's a number of different aspects. I, first of all, I'd like to emphasize one aspect of your question shows the limitations of empirical research. Now, Brecht obviously wrote for people that lived back then. To some extent, I mean, he, he kind of, of, of devised his artworks for a specific situation, uh, historical situation. And we, well, we have no means to catch people uh, uh, who lived back, back then. So, which is an important uh, constraint. So uh, whatever we use, we use at current people. So to some extent, uh, that is good for the artworks because the artworks all have this strange, strange potential to be readable throughout time. No one reads a uh, newspaper article anymore from 1803, but uh, still uh, we read novels from 1803 and other texts. 
uh, uh, now the second. The second is um, a, a more detached mode of verfremdung or whatever, you know, of 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 treating or, or, or of you know influencing our emotions. Well, is certainly accessible to an empirical study. I I'm I'm sure I could measure you like playing with your emotions rather than not. That's, that will certainly uh, make a difference on a number of measurements. And that is, uh, I mean, it's a very com complex thing to do, but that is something empirical studies can do in principle. I mean, you need to not, not go through lengthy preparation, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, make yourself, well, familiar with, with what might be the best uh, uh, measurement to look at and how to identify the, the the phenomenon in question. And the third, my third remark would be, according to my experiences, theater might not be the strongest emotional elicitor. You know, uh, current research, at least with current people, shows that film is the most solid emotional elicitor. And it is, that might, the, the simple reason might be that it's a multi-channel input. I mean, it's, it's, it's visual, it's music, and uh, it's narrative, it's, it's, it's got everything. And to some extent, and many, many people feel uh, that uh, the film through the, these features um, kind, of, kind of get back to the very origins of the arts in, say, in, in ritual dances, which included all sorts of, I mean, visual spectacles, self-adornment, and, 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 and also underlying mythological narratives and everything. So using films, is, is really surprisingly easy. Uh, and you, you always get a very strong signal. Using poems, there you are better off with, you know, people who, who, who uh, make their own choice, on their own the choice to come to that study. But that's not, not bad at all, because all artworks are designed for specific customers, which is why it doesn't make much sense to test them on virtually everyone. Preguntas? Yeah. Well, um, is there any relation between the level of the emotion that people feel and uh, something that they learn or understand f for, her li for their life? Um, yeah. Well, that's, uh, you mean that, that bears on the question of the long-term impact. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, well, yes, I, you, you know, there is evidence that this is true. Uh, we have performed a study, a uh, very, very, uh, you know, demanding study, you treating 180 kids over 12 weeks uh, with a literature program. And we have, you know, we measured their linguistic and emotional capabilities prior to the test and after the test, and we had a control group that gets, got some other treatment over the same period of time. And yes, we did find uh, a number of significant differences. But that's only the starting point. You know, I'm very, very cautious about it um, because uh, the question is to what extent repeated exposure to the arts might lead, I mean, to more long-term changes. So we don't know to what extent the changes we observed after 12 weeks are still in place after six months or after a year. Classic, I mean, typically the notion, the notion underlying liberal education, or the notion why, why there are, you know, literature departments, uh, is deeply based in this, in this understanding that there is uh, something valuable and sustainable uh, that might be derived uh, from encounters with various types of arts. That's a German notion of Bildung, you know, or liberal education, which is now obviously challenged in the political arena uh, and in, in this context I might refer you to a recently published uh, science paper that again shows even far to a far lesser extent the durability of these changes so that's a neuroscientific study uh, uh, that shows the results of the three weeks reading of novels and so they make the case that reading good as opposed to popular novels is, is a more powerful predictor of some change in, in, in terms of the feelings of empathy. 
but again, it's, it, it made it into science, believe it or not, even though it's, uh, the effect is very weak still. But they have, but the thing is, in this case, today, uh, once you sh show it on neuroscientific images, it's more powerful. Mais perguntas? More questions? So it's my turn. <laughs> I, I would like to repeat somehow um, a question I already expressed um, some, some hours ago. Um, you, you know, generally we make distinction in, in literature between fictionality and poeticity. So you, you right. um, when you talked about the poems, you were making the point of the poeticity right. And when you showed us um, the results of the film study, the, the sad film clips, um, I suppose that all that clips were taken from fictional films. That's right? Right. right. So um, my question is, um, is the point the fictionality or is the point the poeticity? What does mm -hmm. uh, really result in being moved? Is it the knowledge of somebody that he knows that the event I'm uh, assisting to is a fictional event, or is it the effect of the making up of uh, the, 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 the scene in the artwork? It's difficult to say because uh, perhaps you, you might have uh, mixed your, your sample in, in the film clips by documentary movies and um, or the almost documentary scenes from uh, Brazilian news are full of moving scenes, you know, when people are dying or when people are... are um, being in, in sad situations, they might be moving, but they are not made up so uh, as, as they would be in Hollywood movies when, when you take the clips from. So my question is, do you have any um, um, evidence that it is in fact, as you would like us to, to believe, the literaricity or the poeticity, the making up um, uh, of the, the scene, or is it the fact that the, the, um, the reader or the, the spectator believes that the scene is not real? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, thank you for uh, the question. Uh, in case, on the case of our uh, film study, yeah, well, you, we did not make any systematic difference. So we, we simply took it, we took it for granted that those are fictional films. And there is very good evidence if you really present a, a film like of an execution uh, as showing a real one or even real torture. So there the top-down process is very powerful. Simply knowing this is a real person really suffering destroys everything. So to that extent uh, that is a powerful factor. At the, on the other hand, on the other hand, so that is we, we I mean we have full of acquired schemas, and we make decisions as to genres, as to art versus non-art, reality versus non-reality, and the, and the like. See, all these things are not alternatives, but they, they join and they kind of are multi, I mean, that's a multifaceted process where all these things uh, uh, join forces. Now, in, in the case of the, of the poems, so what we modified clearly was not bearing on the distinction of fiction versus nonfiction, but only on the, on the distinction of, of poeticity and aesthetic appreciation. There, the answer is clear. It doesn't mean that the other uh, factor doesn't have any results. So we, we only can say, in this case, it is only the, the art artfulness of the language that uh, leads to a significant difference in the effect. Now, um, the, the, the fiction, non-fiction uh, distinction typically cannot be uh, graded the same way uh, uh, the self-similarity can. You can still, still, you know, make perhaps ambiguous categories where you, where you leave it undecided to what extent this is fiction or not. Uh, but my, I would, primarily I would like to say that f fiction is, is not by itself a predictor of aesthetic quality can't. That's very bad fiction and what you can invent virtually everything. Uh, uh, but uh, so that bears on different, different processes. It bears simply on, on, on a fairly abstract cognitive process that tells you this is real versus non-real because this distinction comes with a number of consequences. But this, 
the distinction is fairly insensitive to uh, uh, aesthetic appreciation. So it's often is it, is it said that emotions responding to fictions are not really emotions, uh, but are quasi-emotions. That's the, the issue of as-if emotions, quasi-emotions, or uh, uh, what's Walton's uh, term for it? Make-believe emotions. Make-believe emotions. Uh, that is, however, not true for for aesthetic appreciation. So you know, if you judge, say, on on the beauty of a poem or of a car, or of a uh, whatever person, you know, uh, uh, this is, in terms of reality, it's all equally real. So to some extent, aesthetic appreciation primarily doesn't make the distinction between real fiction and the other, because it's, it's orthogonal, uh, uh, considering that uh, distinction. And fiction makes a contribution to processes that are inherently fairly different from aesthetic appreciation. But that's a factor that then uh, has, uh, has some effect. Again, just imagine, I mean, who of us would actually like to look at, at the real execution or so? But once it's in, the, in a Hollywood movie, barely anyone cares that much, you know? More questions? Uh, to, to what point uh, the appreciation for art or uh, determined uh, scenes it can vary uh, between gender or background history or other demographics like uh, is it possible to measure differences yeah well that's that's a very fruitful line of research Today, I have presented you only uh, studies in which we focused more or less on, on artwork-dependent features rather than on recipient-dependent features. And we always tested, uh, uh, for instance, in, in response to the, to the sad film, gender effects, age effects. In fact, other studies had found gender effects re related to sad films. More or less, they would say, women are more empathic, so women like more sad films. We didn't find that. So that's, I mean, uh, uh, but, but it's also, it's already well established that, for instance, uh, previously acquired expertise with regard, for, for instance, to specifically demanding poetry makes a huge difference. And so does make age. For instance, the very notion of being moved is not available to younger kids. If I knew if a three-year-old would say, I mean, that was a moving film. You would think like, <laughs> so <laughs> that's impossible. So there is an ontogenetic underpinning uh, to, to all terms of aesthetic evaluation. And unfortunately, very little is known. I mean, I, I, could, I could easily run three such institutes with all the open agendas we have, you know. And what you are saying is, is, is uh, well, the sky open of, of research to be performed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I'm sure there's uh, um, much interesting things to be found. Many interesting things, yeah. More questions? Really? Then think, allow me just mo uh, one more question. I appreciated particularly uh, your point of departure, uh, Citron, Horacio, and Quintilian, uh, because of uh, the dimension not only uh, aesthetic, but, but rhetoric and political uh, dimension of their thought. And my question is, uh, if you, how uh, can you in your research uh, go back to this, uh, this plain challenge? Uh, I see uh, you have uh, 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 very well uh, explicitated uh, the aesthetics in the literary field, in the artistic field, but there is a concurrence of, um, from the side of publicity. Uh, Reklame is stärker uh, als Literatur. In this sense, uh, Walter Benjamin uh, already observed the scene scenario in the 1920s. And there's also uh, a concurrence of uh, states, of uh, political configurations, who 
pretend to, uh, that their state is an artwork. It, this may not be only the past, it may come back. Uh, so, uh, uh, retaking the question, how um, uh, can you, you in your research uh, retake this tribal challenge from Cicero, Horace, uh, and Quintilian? Um, well, we have already some lessons learned in this regard. I mean, it's, it's, it's really important to, to be aware of the fact that aesthetics does not mean only art you know, induced uh, events. Aesthetics uh, clearly has to do with all kinds of Cauchian events. As you all know, not just design, fashion, both are all domains of aesthetics, for sure. But also language in all domains. Like uh, a commercial advertisement is, is, is clearly a field where we, we have lots to say about. So we, we already have performed a research on a number of very su successful ads and we know why they work. And, and the same, uh, I mean, that doesn't mean we can, we can produce uh, a series of ongoing such ads. That's not our ambition. So we only want to understand. I, actually, I, purpose, I, I believe uh, there that some of those people uh, in the uh, advertisement research or, or have a very precise theoretical understanding of what they are doing. Uh, now, um, as re was regarded politics, you know, that's very important. Obviously, rhetoric is as much rooted in politics as it is in, uh, in aesthetics and poetics. And we have already performed one study uh, related to uh, uh, politics. That was a study uh, on uh, the acceptance speech held by Barack Obama on the occasion of being nominated first for his first candidacy for presidency in the United States. And uh, that, uh, uh, that speech, you know, was an ideal candidate because to some extent it applied, applied Cicero as a textbook in terms of the rhetorical devices used. So it was fairly easy to kind of take all these devices out and then present the speech uh, in two different versions, which we did. I mean, it was more difficult than expected to get 100 Americans uh, in Berlin, I mean, because it have to be native speakers. It doesn't make sense to, to waste your rhetorical skills on non-native I mean, non speakers to some extent. And uh, yeah, well, that was difficult, but also results were fairly inconclusive, and we had already some anticipations. Why was that the case? Because when we uh, when we performed that study, so I mean the whole Obama, you know, hype was already gone. So to some extent, those, uh, even those who may have liked him then had already different feelings. So there is some aspect in, in political rhetoric that doesn't apply to, to, the, to poetics to the same extent, and that is what in Greek uh, uh, theory is called the kairos. That is, it's tied to a specific moment in time. It can work tonight, but already tomorrow it may be overdone or no longer capture you. And the same applies to, applies to the forensic rhetoric. Those types of rhetoric are so much tied to the moment, to the specific audience addressed, that it's very difficult to use them uh, uh, for empirical research. You know, we had, uh, we had actually also thought about even studying Hitler's rhetoric empirically to find out whether or not even today some people might feel attracted to him by virtue of his, I mean, very bizarre rhetoric. I mean, younger people feel it's right away completely insane, so the way he, he, he moves and whatever he does. But uh, the thing is, it's very difficult to do. You would need to read online during a political campaign. Unfortunately, then you don't have a de rhetoricized version at hand to do it uh, um, at best the very same uh, night. So there are constraints that apply to political speeches but do not apply to the same degree to artworks. Um, I, would, I would love to give a more uh, you know, upbeat answer, but, but this far I'm skeptical to what extent we can really do it. Uh, 
Hi, uh, do you think we can be fully educated to feel one way or another towards an, an image? Or do you think we have a certain autonomy about our own aesthetic perception? I, I wasn't able to formulate exactly what I wanted, but I think it's something like in which level we can make our own aesthetic perception and which, in which level the society or culture or ed education controls us in, cer in a certain way? Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure whether or not I correctly understood you. Uh, you know, you mean you simply imply that, that we have some some uh, some leverage, some some freedom. Yes. To yeah, I think that is something that that applies uh, to a situation where, to some extent, aesthetic options are available, like on a marketplace, mm -hmm. where you kind of feel of step back and and feel you are you are, you are in a distant position, and mm -hmm. perhaps you can even ironically adopt something that you really feel is very good. Uh, I think it's, it's possible to, to, to think of some such thing as a, at least uh, um, a preliminary stage in response to something. Mm -hmm. But you would not really establish a more sustained relationship with an artwork using that approach, but you would not necessarily want to. Mm -hmm. so, so what you describe uh, strikes me as something uh, that is more, yeah, that is typically related to our perhaps to our today's culture where you can make a decision mm -hmm. to make uh, a choice between so many options on each day that you can mm -hmm. kind of uh, turn that into uh, a, a, well a kind of life uh, enhancing device on your part perhaps to say well today I feel like this or that and perhaps mm -hmm. I go for that and also I mean other as dimension is uh, current mood state mm -hmm. you, you Current mood state is is influential in making your choices. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in making a choice as to which movie you would like to see tonight. So that's uh, something that's not that's heavily dependent on, on subtle changes in your in your mood state uh, throughout a week or a day. But but what you said actually I mean, is excruciatingly difficult to treat in a theoretical fashion. Sure. So that would be Any more questions? So, seems not to be the case, so we have come to an end. Thank you very much once again for that rich lecture. I really appreciated it. So, you deserve kind of applause, I think. Thank you.